Hi, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Wilson. I'm a professor in environmental studies at Dartmouth and director of the Irving Institute for Energy and Society. This is part of our new energy series, Conversations with Early Career Energy Researchers. This is a collaborative effort between Dartmouth and the universities you see listed on your screen. And we set this up um, last year to really highlight and showcase the work of assistant professors, of postdocs, of advanced graduate students, because um, they're the future. And understanding where their research is leading us is absolutely critical in this time of, of energy and societal change, energy system and societal change. And today I'm thrilled to introduce you to Sarah Jordan and her talk today on grid scale life cycle assessment of electricity generation builds on a long record of scholarship as an assistant professor at Hopkins before at University of Calgary. Professor Jordan's research has really worked to integrate different types of methodologies like life cycle in new areas and so we're really excited to hear her talk. She'll speak for about 30, 35 minutes, and then we'll open it up for conversation. Please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box in the end, and I'll facil facilitate the conversation after this is over. I'm going to mute myself, and Sarah, over to you. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, you know, I have to say one thing that I'm uh, really already excited about, I think that might be the first time among the only times that someone's pronounced my last name correctly, so I appreciate that, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, my name is Sarah Jordan. I am a professor here at the School of Advanced International Studies at SAIS, also um, with a secondary appointment in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering. So, <clears throat> I'll just give a quick introduction to my research group. We have three different groups or different uh, research areas, life cycle assessment, that's analysis of environmental burdens of products and processes from materials extraction through waste disposal. Uh, we also do techno-economic ana analysis, uh, assessment of economic viability of technology, and it really helps to support decisions related to investments in the advancement of technology as well as policy. And also technology po uh, policy with a focus on energy innovation, more looking at the public administ administration side and how that might feed into the uh, investments and policies implemented by government. Uh, and also just a, a quick note, we do have a postdoctoral fellowship uh, right now. So if you have uh, interest in that, do feel free to follow up. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, Dr. Wilson also has that information as well. And here's just a few examples of the publications coming out of the group uh, that I lead. And a few, a little bit on the collaborators. This research uh, was, mo was uh, made of, uh, possible by uh, mostly these grants down here, the, John, the internal Johns Hopkins awards that I've won, but certainly leverages a lot of the work done at other national laboratories, for example. So quick introduction to environmental life cycle assessment. So it's, a, a, as I mentioned, it's a cradle to grave tool. And we're going to be focusing on greenhouse gas emissions. It's really a, a technology assessment that serves as decision support for improving environmental outcomes. <clears throat> now, you may ha have seen this little cartoon diagram before. It really serves to communicate very nicely uh, the co conceptual approach to life cycle assessment. Uh, but do keep in, in mind that there's actually a robust model or approach that's involved that's, uh, that's uh, internationally standardized, and it does require a lot of data collection and analysis. It's important because it can uncover important trade-offs across supply chains and it has a broad range of applications. It's very interdisciplinary. Here are a few examples, electric vehicles. It depends what type of electricity you're using. Uh, the Keystone Pipeline uh, debate is really a life cycle assessment debate because it's looking at the environmental uh, impacts associated with the upstream uh, oil that's produced in uh, actually the province where I was born, Alberta, Canada. And uh, also liquefied natural gas, because now instead of just using natural gas that is produced in one's own country, uh, it is actually exported and combusted in electricity in other countries, which means that it has the additional supply chain steps associated with that liquefaction. I'm not going to go through this process too much other than to point out 
uh, that uh, there is an, a robust internationally standardized process just to ensure there is consistency. And of course, with the economic interests that are often involved uh, to ensure that if it's used for marketing purposes or other policy uh, met, uh, purposes, then there's really a robust uh, method by, that can be criticized in order to ensure uh, it, the results are credible. Now, just going and digging a little bit deeper again, just keep in mind that for those very simplified processes, we do take into account <clears throat> a lot of different processes involved with different supply chains, which ultimately, uh, from the simplistic perspective, we have a numerator and denominator. The numerator and cap captures all of these uh, different processes and the impacts associated with them, and then relates it to what we call a functional unit. Uh, so that's the the uh, the um, particular unit uh, that to which everything is related to a project product. For example, in the case of electricity generation, it would be a gigawatt hour, megawatt hour, or kilowatt hour, what have you. And so keeping in mind that a decision might, maker might ask, hey, which product is better or worse for climate? We tend to use these char characterization results to aggregate impacts. So for, uh, for carbon dioxide equivalent, we use global warming potentials. Recognizing there are a number of different ways to do this, this is still the approach that remains the recommended metric. So the goal of the research that I'm going to be talking about today uh, is to uh, take a look at how we might employ life cycle assessment to a grid rather than individual technology. So typically it's been focused on a, a, the product of an individual technology on the grid. I'll, go, I'll show you, uh, I'll step you through that in a minute. And in doing so, uh, really the goal is to improve the spatial temporal resolution or the accuracy of grid scale, scale life cycle assessment by taking into account a lot of granular data. Uh, and that can vary depending on the scale of the analysis. So I'll step through two examples uh, very more comprehensively. One is uh, inefficient transmission and distribution infrastructure associated with the global uh, power grid. Uh, and also then I will take a little bit more resolved site level approach by giving you an example of an integrated optimization LCA model associated with the Western interconnection. If we have time, I'll just give you a quick glance of uh, my, one of my postdocs work and uh, that should give you an idea of, of what's up and coming. So traditional life cycle assessments of electricity generation. So taking into account, you know, for example, if you add this additional step of liquefied natural gas, you can imagine that you would have gas production, which goes through processing a whole bunch of midstream infrastructure. It could be burned domestically, but we're now more seeing this ocean, uh, this liquefaction, ocean transport, regasification, and use in power combustion. Now, this is some early work where we were taking a look at what has already been published. Uh, and so what you'll see here is uh, that these are all LCAs looking at the same thing. So we look, took a look at the upstream natural gas and we added on the additional liquefaction uh, through end use stage, assuming it's exported out of the country. Now, what we found, and this is very true to all LCAs that you might example, uh, examine, is that there are subtle differences in the system boundaries and the model de decisions, and that can make a really big difference. And we found that that you know clearly it's very applicable for the region of study as well. So, for example, um, there can even be different reporting thresholds associated with the facilities that are included in the analysis and reported by governments. And that can impact the result, which might not even necessarily mean there's greater or less, uh, greater or fewer emissions. So we dug into this a little bit more and we decided to um, examine, oh, just a quick note, you'll see here, the one thing we focused on once we got the distribution for the upstream emissions, was a lot of the um, a lot of the analyses would make simplified assumptions of the uh, energy efficiency of the power generation as well as the transmission and distribution losses. So that would be what's lost through the power lines once it gets to the importing nation. So we took a look at this and we decided to characterize these based on published data for each of the countries, and we found that this uh, this country level efficiency 
uh, and the transmission and distribution losses can really have a substantial impact on what the results look like. So it's not just what type of technology you use, it's really regionally dependent. So you might take a look, for example, at India, which has very high transmission and distribution losses in the power grid, and also lower efficiency than some other countries uh, for power generation. So uh, really applying country, these uh, some generic country level emissions factors or even generic if it's not related to a specific country can really, uh, really make a difference. And so uh, these, these uh, parameters actually really matter. And uh, what we were really surprised about or what I was really surprised about was the fact that transmission and distribution matter, uh, losses mattered so much. Which really led to some dis discussions with my collaborator, uh, Dr. Kavita Serrano. And so uh, we spent many hours in my office discussing this and how it really hasn't been well characterized in life cycle assessment. So what does it mean to lose electricity within the power grid to the amount of electricity that's uh, generated and the emissions associated with that electricity? Uh, Elizabeth, can you still hear me? I just wanna make sure I'm still connected. Yep, you, yep, 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 you're doing great. This is okay. really interesting. I Wonderful, yeah, thank you. And I might check in once more because sometimes my internet connection cuts out. So if I do that, uh, just a vocal hello would be really wonderful. Gotcha. Okay, so uh, it, once we started looking deeper, we realized that it's actually really quite complex. So the transmission and distribution infrastructure in the grid the inefficiencies aren't only from these technical losses. So that's, for example, if it, you have aging infrastructure or poor, uh, less uh, lower quality metals, the, which would result in losses from resistance or grid operation and maintenance. There are also these non-technical losses. And so this means that it still might be used to a certain degree um, or lost, uh, you know, or not, not accurately measured. So examples would be pilferage and stealing, fraud, inefficient metering and, and billing. So this again led to many other hours of discussion about how we characterize that. So I'll show you in a, in, in a few minutes what our results look like. So the transmission and distribution losses, just to, to ground us again, the, it's the percentage of generated electricity that is lost between the source of supply and the distribution to the customer, okay? So because of those losses, we have what we call compensatory generation. So that means that power plants are required to generate more than one kilowatt hour to deliver a kilowatt hour to a customer. And so this additional generation results in greater emissions. So we call those compensatory emissions. So our question was, what are the emissions outcomes of reducing these losses, not just characterizing what they are, but how much we might be able to reduce losses, which led us to the question, Okay, so are people actually looking at this? So we did a review of the submitted nationally determined contributions to the UNFCCC for the Paris Agreement, and only 32 of those, uh, those NDCs mentioned grid efficiency, grid efficiency or T&D losses, whereas we found 110 mentioned renewables. So this really pointed out to us that, wow, there could really be a, a big policy opportunity to address these emissions. So how did we characterize them? So I'm just gonna give a plug for my colleague at, at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, Garvin Heath Research. Um, what he did uh, and his group, his colleagues, is that they did a large scale systematic review of existing LCAs. And of course I noted before those slight variations in results based on the system's boundaries. Well, so what they did was they, they collected hundreds of different life cycle assessments and they did the systematic review and what is called harmonization. So they adjusted those estimates to be more consistent and comparable, okay? They omitted t and losses for consistency across all of those with the goal of reducing variability and clarifying the central tendency of the greenhouse gas emissions. So they, they have a, a published data set where they characterize, where, where they produce all of these life cycle assessments, both published and harmonized. So back to our question, how much do they matter? So really this slight difference in system boundaries matters a lot. So you can look at electricity, the emissions per unit electricity generated. This is the functional unit that I mentioned before. And here you only look up to the electricity generation at the power plant. 
Now, what we decided to do is say, okay, well, let's take it a step further and characterize not just the electricity generation at the power plant, but the transmission and distribution, so i.e. the delivery to the consumers. We did this for 142 countries. So it was quite the task, uh, but we did have these nice data sets to work with. So this gives you an example of what was included for each of those 142 countries. Uh, we had the grid generation mix. So this is just an illustrative generic system boundaries that we employ, employed for each country's country in the analysis. Clearly it varied slightly for each of them. Then for each of the countries, we ca calculated uh, the emissions factors using the median value of life cycle emissions from each source. We then apply distributions afterwards to account for uncertainty. Um, so uh, in doing so, uh, we adjusted the emissions factor for each country using the life cycle emissions to account for the power plant efficiencies in those specific countries. We started with the World Bank, but ultimately we updated those to, uh, to include some other data sets as well to characterize the efficiency associated with each of those countries. Additionally, uh, we also accounted, did the same for T&D losses. We then ran the data through a Monte Carlo simulation to provide us with distributions for the analysis. So 10,000 iterations for each of the 140, I believe it's 142 countries in the end that we had looked at, so don't mind that 141. And uh, these are the probability distributions that we determined. Uh, so we said, okay, we have, uh, we characterized what exactly the emissions might look like, and those emissions turned out to be something on the order of uh, just under, just around a billion tons of carbon dioxide emissions every year. We then said, okay, what if we reduce those em emissions to the point that we can actually get them to the OECD uh, average or reduce them uh, to uh, towards uh, the lowest published emissions, so that's 2%. Uh, percent. Uh, that's in Singapore, and that's where the bottom of the distribution of what we assumed that those countries could reach that were already at OECD level, so that would really be approaching zero. Singapore has high efficiency because uh, clearly it's uh, very close together, uh, so the transmission and distribution losses are lower. At any rate, so what we did was we estimated that really we could reduce those emissions by approximately half, so quite substantial. And just to show you what we found is we wanted to also point out uh, the country level variability. And of course, as mentioned, there are technical losses which are much easier to reduce. And the aggregate losses uh, would also include the non-technical losses. Okay, so this became quite a point of contention because how do you reduce, so, so if there's pilferage, for example, that, uh, that electricity is going to be used regardless. So there could still be emissions associated with it. Okay, but clearly there are other reasons. Uh, there are other uh, types of technical losses where we know we can reduce. So we teased these out based on our current knowledge of the data systems. So uh, focusing in on reduction in technical losses, for example, you can see here uh, that there are some countries, uh, this is an emissions factor, okay? So that's taking into account the amount of electricity that's generated, so gram CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour, but we also did an annual estimation. The reason why that's important is you'll notice, for example, uh, the United States and India look like the reduction potential is not very big, but their generation is so high that really some small reductions can be equivalent to other countries. So we wanted to capture that in order to help, uh, help with developing the best solutions. So what does this mean for future emissions? So what we did is we examined these uh, emissions outcomes under three generation scenarios. So we use the International Energy Agency's uh, scenarios of current policies, uh, the new policy scenario, and the sustainable development scenario. So that would represent uh, policies that are, were legislated as of mid-2017, uh, uh, representative of the information at the time the analysis was completed, uh, and then those that would be announced policies, and those as if we were to be met, meeting uh, sustainable development goals in the Paris Agreement. <clears throat> 
And so we don't know what's happening going into the future. Hopefully with the new administration, there will be a lot more action towards reducing emissions. But again, it's we're facing an uncertain future. So looking under all of these potential scenarios moving into the, into the future, let's take a look at 2040. Okay, so this green one, you would say, wow, it doesn't really have that big of an effect. Well, not necessarily. That's a sustainable development scenario. So just because the emissions reduction potential is lower, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's not additional benefits. For example, the electricity generated from those renewable technologies are better protected from those grid inefficiencies. Therefore, you can imagine that it would be a, a more economically efficient system. Whereas if we lived in a world where there were no new policies, you can see that the potential impact in addition to those uh, benefits, for example, of protecting renewables from grid inefficiencies, you see a very large potential. So reaching up that the emissions reduction potential reaching up over a billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. So I'm going to step through some, or some, some solutions and then go on to the second case study, which I hope uh, you will enjoy. Uh, so implementation of the mitigation. So keeping in mind these, this broad level analysis is sort of like if you do like 140, 142 uh, greater around there type of analysis, uh, really uh, what you find is that uh, you do have you do have to make some broad assumptions. So in order to really implement really powerful and, and, uh, and, and effective mitigation, you would have to go into each country and account for the spatial differentiation within each grid analyzed. And I'll show you an example of that on the next step. Um, the potential solutions that if we just look at those technical losses, uh, you might consider improving transmission efficiency. So that would be replacing inefficient wires, use of superconductors, for example, uh, using uh, high voltage DC, improving distribution inefficiencies uh, might be or sorry, efficiencies might include better load management or uh, for example, or a better line configuration. In terms of non-technical losses, you can imagine tamper-proof meters, restructuring and restructuring power systems ownership. So a lot to think about there in terms of what might happen as you examine specific countries with, with greater granularity. Uh, so um, of course it depends on the country, uh, but taking into account the fact that as we move forward to specific country level solutions, clearly the, these geographically textured analyses should be involve uh, uh, multiple stakeholders to really get together and determine the best data to identify spatial variability uh, and the most cost effective and sustainable solutions. Okay, so let's up the ante a little bit. We just looked at the country level, but we can get more resolved than that. Uh, so, if we look at grid level improvements, so we're going to take a little bit of a look at, at renewable integration and policy changes. So uh, a lot of these uh, product LCAs use uh, generation weighted averages and they look at, uh, you know, um, they don't tend to look at the operations of individual plants and interactions. And what we actually found in the paper I'm about to present is that uh, also only looking at the optimization models. So if you take if you look to to look at how a grid interacts without accounting for the full what happens upstream, the life cycle emissions, you can underestimate emissions by 18 to 30%. So the purpose, <clears throat> the purpose of this uh, analysis is to really develop a more robust approach that integrates optimization and life cycle assessment to better estimate uh, the impacts of, of regional generation. And we uh, compiled a lot of plant level uh, inputs and uh, that were based on an optimization model. And we looked at a number of different scenarios, which includes the upstream fuel supply. Here's our study area. It's a Western interconnection. Uh, it, it accounts, uh, encompasses some or all of 14 states. Uh, can two provinces of Canada, small slice of Mexico. Uh, and just keep in mind this number here uh, in terms of capacity, the uh, 65 
uh, gigawatts, 265 gigawatts must be reflective of a more recent year. I'm suspecting than what's shown in the 2018. At any rate, so just keep in mind that number, 265 gigawatts, because it will be important for the story in, uh, up, upcoming. So uh, how can we seek to integrate these two types of methodologies? So um, what we did, I started reading my collaborator, Benjamin Hobbs's work. He's a professor in environmental health and engineering. And they were developing this model called the Johns Hopkins Stochastic Multi-Stage Integrated Network Expansion Model. It's quite a mouthful, so let's call it Jasmine from now on. Uh, so what it does is it performs a simultaneous co-optimization of, of generation, transmission, and optimization of across a set of scenarios. So it'll look at the choices that we have today, for example, and then it will look at uh, what will happen in a 10-year investment uh, window. And then uh, there will be another stage where we'll look at the potential choices after then. Now we use this stochastic model in the present analysis and used it more deterministically by saying, okay, we have a whole bunch of different scenarios that we can look at. And if we understand the grid interactions within those scenarios, what are the life cycle implications? So noticing the subtlety in systems boundaries and functional unit again, this is similar to the prior analysis. However, it excludes transmission and distribution losses. It includes site level information, the grid interactions and storage technologies. So you see that down here, okay? Now, um, so the this was really proof of concept. It started off, I actually, there was not any funding to it initially. I ended up using some Johns Hopkins funding, uh, but it was really because I was excited. I thought, hey, what about the potential? So <clears throat> we developed, or I developed the model using uh, results from the Jasmine model. And we included different configurations in the scenarios we examined that included pumped hydro, compressed air energy storage, battery energy storage, and new transmission and wind capacity, and a variety of carbon prices. So different configurations of all of these. Do take note how large the storage is. Okay, it's very small in comparison to the capacity that we're looking at. And similar to the prior analysis, I again used NREL's harmonization results and coupled them with all this information in addition to some storage data. So these are the scenarios that were examined in the analysis. You'll see that there's different, so there are 21 in total, uh, including all of the technologies uh, and carbon prices uh, noted here. And the carbon prices were 0, 20, 58, and 100. So for each individual representative plant that was modeled in the, in the co-optimization model, I uh, scaled the life cycle uh, emissions according to the emissions, sorry, the heat rates of each of the individual units. Uh, using those, I then applied distributions to each of the individual units inside the study to characterize. So these are the distributions that I applied to each of the individual units to capture the uncertainty that's involved with uh, potential life cycle emissions associated with each plant. These are the results kind of more broadly. Okay, I'm just checking the time. So I'll wrap up relatively yeah, quickly. We're doing great, we're doing great. Okay, good, good. Um, so thank you very much. And it's good to hear you so that I know that everyone's still on. So that's good news. Um, so uh, what you'll see here, uh, these are the results of not only the scenarios, but the technologies. The reason why uh, that I included the technologies here is to really show that you get the greatest emissions reduction by clearly not using sources that result in high levels of emissions. Okay, but we know that there are challenges associated with the other sources. Uh, so right now, uh, you know, moving along the lines of better understanding how a transition may happen. So uh, this is an example of which. So if you examine each of these, you'll really see under these small incremental additions, which were actually vetted by the WEC. So while they might seem small, these are quite substantial in terms of actually increasing capacity at this point in time at any rate. Um, so what you'll see is that the largest reductions appear to occur with uh, changes in carbon price. So these are the analyses <clears throat> shown uh, up closer. So with these small changes, which actually are quite substantial projects, 
uh, you see a little variation between uh, tech, between options, but that increase in uh, carbon price really dries down the emissions. So changes the operations of the grid such that those higher emitters uh, uh, generate less electricity. Now, the most exciting thing about this particular project is that I thought, you know, there's all this hourly data. Why am I still scaling to the annual level? So what I then did was I uh, worked with the data that was available. And within the Jasmine model, they represent in the future with these additional technology additions uh, for representative days associated uh, with uh, different times of the year. Uh, so you can imagine different seasons. Uh, so within there, um, we, I applied the, uh, the same technique for each hour of these representative days. And it showed the same results, okay? So really what's the driver with these particular uh, scenarios, it's the carbon pricing. The reason why it's important though, that we take a look at this is if we really seek to make a difference of what happens in the grid, if we don't account for what happens throughout the day, the impacts of specific interventions might be misestimated or underestimated. So using this approach, we can start to look at some scenarios, but you can imagine that we might now be able to move towards using this approach to create inventions or interventions, apologies, to create interventions at specific time periods, which may have greater outcomes or more environmentally superior outcomes. Okay, I think I have enough time to do the snapshot. Yeah. So, okay, snapshot, uh, US natural gas fired electricity. So again, this is my work uh, with Dr. Sakina Tavakoli, who's been uh, developing this model. <clears throat> I did want to emphasize, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, just have a sip of tea. So I did want to emphasize, um, this is, uh, this work is done with quite substantial infrastructure data sets, but the impacts of those efficiencies over time really matter. So in the US grid, we have seen an increase in efficiency of the, the natural gas fired power fleet, okay? And so all these studies that we see talking about upstream emissions point out really important emissions that must be reduced. However, in the comparisons, for example, to higher carbon sources, it's still really important to take into account the efficiency of power generation, okay? So here you see the amount of emissions per um, uh, unit electricity generated are decreasing over time. But there's an increase in electricity generated from natural gas fired power. So do keep in mind that if you see these uh, efficiency improvements, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you're expanding the amount of electricity generated from that particular source, that it doesn't mean that those are reducing. You'll see that they're increasing over time in, uh, within the displacement of, of the older coal fired power. That becomes more important, however, if we start to think of futures where we have less nuclear power, for example. Okay, so really that caveat of nat natural gas can have some form of environmental benefit necessitates the replacement of a higher carbon source. Okay, into the future, these types of arguments uh, become more tricky. <clears throat> so, uh, conclusions uh, the mitigation potential of reducing transmission and distribution losses is often overlooked. So it's approximately a billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year, uh, which we estimate can be cut in half just by um, some improvements in those countries which already have relatively good efficiency and those, uh, those countries which have substantial uh, TND losses reaching OECD levels or nearing OECD levels. <clears throat> Not only are these emissions reduced, but keep in mind, for example, as we look through the sustainable, the EIA sustainable development scenario, that those low carbon investments are also protected from grid inefficiencies. <clears throat> but I'm just going to take a minute to point out the very real need to refine analyses with more granular data, and then you can pinpoint these optimal solutions that we might be able to see, for example, in the second case study that we looked at. 
Um, these, uh, so looking at the second, really it points out the importance of these detailed evaluations of regional grid impacts because they can not only uncover more realistic estimates of the trade-offs, but they can also contribute towards these planning decisions. Um, what we noticed is that there is uh, the grid level emissions uh, really only have subtle differences based on this level of capacity additions, okay? But that doesn't mean that there wouldn't be greater impact if we looked towards uh, more ambitious decarbonization using uh, lower carbon technologies. Carbon pricing, however, if we look, especially in the short term, I like to point this out. So if we look in the short term, you increase, you have a carbon price, it can really result in substantial impact on the emissions by lowering the operation of these fossil fuel burning plants. <clears throat> I would uh, I would like to also emphasize that having better spatially resolved upstream characterization, especially of natural gas, could further improve results and point out areas where emissions can be reduced. And uh, also, as we move forward, uh, using such approaches to high renewable storage scenarios, I think could really be beneficial because you can point out, for example, okay, so if we would need to add this much of this technology in order for it to be equivalent to a higher carbon price, or how can we figure out those nice middle grounds where we might be doing both? And so I, I wanted to conclude, and I, I understand we'll have some statements after, before I pass back to Elizabeth, uh, and I'll just show some acknowledgements beforehand that using more granular data and results can really support the identification of not only the impacts, but importantly, the solutions that might otherwise be overlooked. So just a few acknowledgements to my collaborators and to the data uh, that we use within these analyses, <clears throat> most of these analyses. And I will now pass it uh, back to Elizabeth. Thank you so much. This was just a super presentation and I have this list of questions I wanna ask and I know our audience is writing too. Please um, type your questions in the Q&A box and, and we'll go forward from there. Um, I really appreciated, I mean, as somebody who, who cares a lot about the grid, I really appreciated your concentration and focus on um, the losses from the transmission distribution um, network. And one of the things that um, I've really appreciated is how hard some of the data are to get. And especially for some of the countries that you're working in in your maps, can you just describe kind of how good you think the data was? I mean, I, I used to live in Burundi where 6% of the population has electricity. And so I can appreciate that their data might not be the most up to date. And I'm just wondering how much you believe the data in different places and what some of the sensitivities were for you in managing and getting those data. Well, yeah, so just a quick start with sensitivities. We did we did apply two different data sets to test the sensitivities, uh, which is available in our publication. But I do, I just want to agree with you. Uh, we can't, you know, rely on the data being perfect in a lot of places, which is why we spend a lot of our time really emphasizing the need to look more granularly within each country. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of one of those things where I, I hope this paper sparks a lot of debate and then hopefully gets some more action in this area. And if it leads to other papers that, you know, pr publish greater, more accurate data, even better. But I would say that it's relatively accurate in, you know, a lot of the developed countries, but there certainly would be some questions for some of the, and, and there's like, I mean, even if you look at somewhere like India, they're improving substantially, like right. every year, like from the, our first data set that we included, there was like, you know, in our preliminary analysis, I think there were a couple of percent uh, improvements in just what was reported. Again, we don't know everything that's going on on the ground, and that's the limitation to these global types of studies. Um, but, uh, but you know, it really does indicate, uh, you know, really fast paced sector. And hopefully, you know, some of this work can really influence what happens as things evolve. And one of my other questions on this, I mean, you know, people always joke that when you're thinking about transmission, the only people that love transmission lines are transmission line engineers. Well, and grid operators, right? Because that's what makes the system work. But in your system and in all of the different improvements, um, how much does it cost? How much does it actually cost to get some of these? And what are the different changes and the different costs associated with that? Could you speak to that a little bit? 
So I'll, I'll do my best. That ultimately was one of the things that we hoped is that would be a, a, a really nice next step for the work. So we haven't done a ton of work. We did find though, uh, you know, on the, on, you know, to kind of bring up another really important point is that there are a lot of these government led grid initiatives, which are seeking to invest quite substantially into the different projects. But yeah, mm. I mean, I think it would be actually really nice to show all the different technologies that you might apply, their potential impact, right? So you could imagine the, the potential impact and the potential cost. But you One know, of those McKinsey graphs like we had for energy efficiency back in the early, early 2000s. Right, or methane abatement or what yep. have you. Yep, yeah, exactly. Right. No, I think that would be really neat to have. So I haven't seen that yet. I have seen a little bit of data on one DOE report, uh, mm -hmm. but that's something that we're really interested in. No, that's really great. Um, one of the questions here from Brendan, um, Brendan Daly, will, will the life cycle model be updated to reflect new policies such as Biden's initiative to electrify the federal government fleet of vehicles? And maybe that question too of how do you think about learning and how do you think about learning over time driving performance in kind of any future projections? I know you're looking at the snapshot in time, but it'd be interesting just to understand how those uh, different policies or assumptions would, would change some of your results. Yeah, so um, so so I'm actually really interested in looking in one of the models that Ben is doing a little bit more focus on the optimization side, which it to me provides means an opportunity because then I can hopefully work with him and do some more of the LCA stuff. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we have actually been in discussion with including electric vehicles because clearly they serve the dual role of transportation, but also uh, potential grid storage. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, I would like to start updating the models. And I think we can even go beyond, you know, we did Western interconnection here and one broad global study, um, but clearly it would be really nice to take a look at the regional differentiation. CMU actually also has some really nice studies. Uh, actually, I really like the, that particular publication. They had one particular publication where they looked at EVs and actually it does need to be updated because it was it, it was kind of like right before the big shift towards 2009, natural. 2009, was that the Samaras paper, Costa Samaras, was it that one? Okay, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great one. one. It's a really nice yeah. paper because it shows the regionalization. That's the one, right? So yeah, it shows yeah, yeah. the regionalization of the electric vehicles and then, you know, really points out, but then there was this big shift. So it's sort of like, well, you know what happens next so hopefully he will be updating that uh so well, and I, yes, and honestly your data being able to show hours and how when you charge really could determine the carbon component is something that with my uh uh colleague tim smith at university of minnesota and his graduate student mo lee we're looking at for like heat pumps in the upper midwest because when they operate is actually really important for their eventual carbon profile on that kind of marginal emission story so okay. I, I love that part of your work, but I was wondering how do you account then for the fact that coal plants are cycling a little bit differently and maybe not, it may be more carbon intensive in their stories. Well, yeah, actually, you know, and this is, so Emory Genser, I know, has been doing some work on it, and I think he did a study on California, he's at MIT, he's a research okay. scientist there, yep. um, but uh but that actually, I, I'm, I'm going to answer your question, not with an answer because it wasn't a focus of our study, but with like another comment of something that I think needs to be looked at, uh, you know, increasingly uh, is that uh, that also matters for natural gas generation. Uh, because mm -hmm. as, yep, as exactly. we, you know, uh, work with the um, in more intermittent energy, it also faces those questions. Now, I, as I recall, Emory's study for one region showed that I believe to date it, it had a, it wasn't a huge substantial impact. That doesn't, you know, it's kind of one region. I haven't seen anything, you know, and even at one study, I mean, we need to kind of really take a look and do a lot of different scenarios to get to the question because it's going to end up really thorny with the different regions, uh, how the grid actually interacts. Um, and, I, and I'm not sure yeah. how the continuous emissions monitoring on the coal plants actually operates when they're going up and down. Like, I, I don't know if it's getting turned off and on or then or how it's how it's capturing those shifts. I mean, that, that's a question that I know Jeremy Schreifels, who was at EPA and now, now RFF, could answer for us. But, but it's just one of those things that popped into my head when you were saying it. And yeah. so, I, I, again, I think with, with Ben's work on markets and your work on LCA, there's such wonderful compliments and right. um and, and just and, so we did we did talk about the ramping rates at length but it's actually it's not captured in the jet it, it will it, it, there might be a student working on it, but it wasn't captured within that particular model because that was one question i had okay well mm -hmm. you know we are finding only marginal changes how much could that affect the results so no so that's, that's, that's needs to be done there 
One of the, the questions here um, from an anonymous attendee was for either of the first or second case study, could you comment on how the LCA uncertainty aggregated as you processed throughout the work going into more complex scale, for example, global under different future scenarios? I'm trying to figure out then just the aggregation and I guess an uncertainty of data is and, and one of your slides where you had, we can go back to the slide where you had the technical difficulties and the aggregated um, challenges and with kind of oh, like yeah, scenario A and that. scenario C. That's right. Can you repeat the question again, just because I was having a little bit well, of a challenge. Exactly. Um, they were interested in, in the um, LCA uncertainty in the aggregated uh, analyses and how that changed as you went through the work and looking at different scales from specific regions to countries to, um, to globally. Yeah, you know, we haven't done a robust comparison, but clearly it would be, it's, it's ultimately dependent on, uh, you know, the, the distribution within each technology type, right? So that would be apparent here. So one would presume that those countries that have higher levels of coal, for example, would likely have a greater uh, distribution associated with them. Uh, so that would be the kind of the short answer. In terms of the aggregate versus technical, that uh, would, so the, the, the distribution in those particular cases for each country would not necessarily change because the emissions difference is embedded within the, uh, it's embedded within the mix by each country. Oh, right, so that would mean that it would also depend on how many emissions are reduced by each country, so it could. So at the country level, it wouldn't matter, at the global level, it might. Okay, that's interesting to think about the, how your, how, where you focus your, salute, your, your questions, you'll end up with slightly different um, uh, Skewers there. Um, KL, hey KL, good to see you here in the crowd. Um, great talk, thanks. Uh, very much like the theme towards improving granularity, improving resolution. Do you have some ideas of how much of this story is lost in low resolution analysis beyond solutions which you mentioned, but possibly in terms of understanding the scale of the problem? Yeah, so, you know, I actually was quite surprised. So we even just, even if you, even if you take global grid emissions and just do like a back, that's when we were looking at it going, this is actually really big. So then we actually, we just said, okay, well, let's just say there's X percent of losses and do a back of the envelope calculation. We're like, wow, it's actually on track. Now, I would argue that I haven't seen and actually, Kostas wrote this, uh, Samaras wrote that, who I haven't met in person, but we sometimes email. He wrote, he was ended up being uh, one of the people who wrote a commentary about our piece. And, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's actually the first of its kind. And so this, to me, signals and indicates that um, interest, when I hear uh, folks say, oh, yeah, all that work has been done, we know there's not a problem. Um, because it's relatively small, I would always continue to question if the analysis hasn't been done thoroughly. Because, uh, you know, we ended up, we worked on this analysis, uh, these analyses for long periods of time. And we really, at every step, were surprised at how substantial the difference can be and how it differs per country. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would, I would argue that, you know, in terms of the fact that this hasn't been actually really identified to this point, and really, you know, clearly it is in some countries, and there's grid modernization here, and there's a similar initiative in India, for example, that, you know, when we, the fact that we haven't addressed it to this point, and that there are only, you know, there's such a, a small number of countries that actually include it in their NDCs really highlights to me that we need to be really digging down into these problems. And to be quite honest with you, if we went more granular, uh, you know, I question whether or not we might be, you know, if in certain regions there can sometimes be a, a really heavily loaded transmission line which has very high losses. So how much of these can, you know, how much of the, I haven't even seen anything, could this be like a similar analogy to the super emitters and the methane emissions where if mm -hmm. we like really focus on, on reducing some big losses, we can have quite a big impact. So I would argue, you know, if you hear anybody say, oh, everyone's already looked at that, it's already been done, make sure the analysis has been, been done really carefully and thoroughly. And, and now that we're getting better data, taking into account the more improved spatial data, you see limitations in the data that I used even still, that's going to get better over time. So hopefully in 10 years, someone will be coming along, you know, hey, I've just done the update on this using all the granular data that we have available now. And we found that we can improve these 
you know, five problems with this, these three technologies very simply. So I would just recommend to keep digging and make sure that um, it's not just broad statements of people saying, oh, someone looked at that 10 years ago and it's not a problem because we were really surprised. I, I mean, one of the questions, and I think you had this in the slide, for you know, to be able to capture this 500 million ton reduction, what is a hardware issue? What is a software issue? What is a grid operator issue? I mean, how do those different technological or behavioral components kind of kind of break down? Because when you're going over some of the pieces, I appreciated that some of them might be behavioral and some of them might be politically impossible. And some of them might be requiring a lot of capital, whereas others you could do with a control system update. And so yeah. I just didn't know from, from um, kind of the how to capture these emissions, like what the different pieces and technological components could be. Yeah, so I'm just gonna, you know, another thing that we spent a lot of time looking at. So, uh, so we know that, you know, in, in places that have experienced war, for example, uh, there can actually be quite substantial in, increases in uh, losses in particular systems, whether they're fragile or they've experienced some, uh, some level of uh, environmental challenges. Uh, so really, this points out the fact that these aren't always, uh, uh, you know, problems that could be solved uh, using simple uh, simple technologies alone. So you're, you're directly on point. Uh, so regarding, uh, and then I'm just going to take a, a step back and then go back up to this particular slide here, because what I'm going to point out is again, you know, here we have the technical losses in India and then the aggregate. This, this is including uh, the uh, non or the, the, the pilferage, etc. And so really a quite a substantial chunk of it, um, you know, is is remains technical, but there are those additional improvements that can occur uh, by uh, by improving uh, those, you know, and, and those particular like line losses, ensuring em efficiency, but in terms of actually determining exactly what types of gadgets are resolved, this is a trade off you get between, you know, a global type of analysis, and then the really regionally, regionally specific one where we can look at, okay, so we have this global idea, that's great. But what does it mean in actuality when we look at a specific grid where we can say you can add a carbon price of X, Y, and Z, and you can add all these different technological configurations. So again, in terms of determining exactly what gadgets or solutions that are required, we can only make broad estimates uh, with the country level data of what those might look like in order to determine the exact interventions. This is the importance of having this type of analysis where you go in and you say, what if we added all these these additional gadgets, mm -hmm. which would result in a different type of uh, grid interaction. Well, and what I appreciated from this chart that shows that at the hourly scale was that you really highlight um, in your comments the importance of short term carbon price for affecting dispatch order, but also then longer term how that would affect investment decisions. That's right. With the recognition that the grid is big and expensive and those investment decisions will take a decade to be seen, but that you can also in a shorter term have substantial changes in your carbon because of a carbon price. That's right. And I mean, also pointing out that the total systems costs clearly under higher carbon prices will be lower if you have more renewables on the grid. Uh, because uh, it provides the additional incentive to uh, on the longer term, particularly as technology costs fall. I mean, the whole, uh, we know, you know, when, um, you know, I guess it's close to, you know, over 12 years ago when I was doing my doctorate at that time, you know, it was really only cool that people could foresee operating cost effectively on the grid. So we've seen a really different world emerge where we have renewables that are, competitive in many cases and the cost of storage falling rapidly. So this is going to really change this picture quite substantially as we seek to better understand, you know, the implications of longer term investments.
So I wanted to give you a, a minute to just wrap up and, and, and let the audience know what we should all be looking out for in the future, both with your research and also what you think the big questions are driving going forward. And then I'll share the upcoming events. Sounds good. Okay, so just to, you know, again, um, I, I do think it's important to continue to question, you know, there's something certainly we have a good understanding of, but a lot of the time the assumptions that we place on what we consider to be the largest contribution can to, to emissions, if we solely focus on those, we can really miss important opportunities. Right now, uh, again, we're lucky not only just because the cost of renewables and lower carbon emissions have dropped, but also because we have access to larger amounts of data that can enable us to actually start to ask these questions and determine um, more effective solutions, whether they're in specific locations or implemented at specific times of the day. Um, in terms of my research moving forward, I have uh, some work on, uh, ongoing on uh, carbon capture and utilization, uh, techno-economic analysis in that domain, uh, other work on innovation and policy and always life cycle assessment that is ongoing. So with some uh, number of different collaborators looking at uh, additional global work, but also uh, US based and focusing on land use and, and greenhouse gases amongst other things. So that should give you a bit of an idea, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, things evolve and certainly for what uh, what talented students come out of your group as well, Elizabeth. So thank you so much for the invitation. I had a great time and wonderful to see you. Sarah, it's great to see you. Thanks for participating. Um, again, she's looking for a postdoc. This is an opportunity to change your life. We're really thinking about our emerging energy system. So Sarah, thanks again for being part of today. Really super to have you. And everybody, thank you for participating. This talk will be up on our website by the weekend. Thanks, Elf.